It's such a joy again to see you. Welcome to Surge Church and our Brad Sullivan Ministries a Men's Conference. Man, you know, I wrote a book several years ago called Stepping Into Manhood. It was born out of me getting invited across town to speak at a men's breakfast. I just jotted some, the phrase came into my spirit, I jotted a few notes down, went over there, did the thing, and I got such a great response. I started like, well, I'll write it into a pamphlet. I never set out to have a men's ministry or a men's conference like this. It was never, you know, we travel around the world. We do all kinds of things. So we would minister in all kinds of settings. But it was that one thing. You know, it's something how, you know, if, if you'll just be faithful where you are, God will do something that you never thought was coming, right? God finds big people in small places if you think big. Come on. So I started writing it. I was like, man, maybe it'll make a good pamphlet and then turn into a book. And then that year it was used for the University of Alabama football team's uh, Bible study. That was the 2009 season when then Coach Saban's first championship, which I like to take credit for, but I wouldn't tell him that, though. Then that launched the conference, and then here we are 13 years later, and we certainly appreciate you. I want you to know you got big things coming to your life. you got big things coming in your future. What the enemy tried to cancel in 2020, we're declaring victory in 2021, W-O-N. 2021 is 2020, W-O-N. Amen? So, hey, we're talking about release, releasing the warrior. And, man, we got some warriors in this house tonight, and so as I minister the word... I want you to say amen. amen. All right? And uh, if, I, if I say something you like, I want you to say amen. And if I say something you don't like, I want you to go ahead and say amen anyway. Because you need it. You know you need it, right? What do you guys think of the shield wall back there? I want you to get a visual. That's what we are in this hour. We have to be a wall, right? We need, we need some. The church needs fewer beta males and more alpha males. Right? Your wife's tired of you being a beta male. Come on, somebody. We need some alpha males in the kingdom of God. You know, it's interesting. When you read the Bible, those were, some, those were studs, man. Those were dudes. And we need today, come on, some men to rise up and be the champions and the warriors. Because it's already inside you. You just got to release it. You got to let, let that guy out of you. Amen? Hey, 1 Samuel chapter 22, verse 1 through 2, it says, David left Gath and escaped to the cave of Adullam. When his brothers and his father's household heard about it, they went down to him there. And all those who were in distress or in debt or discontented gathered around him. Come on, there's a gathering around tonight, amen? And he became their commander. About 400 men were with him. You know, this scripture embodies that phrase, that statement, release the warrior. You know, after David killed Goliath, and he began to perform heroically in the army of Israel, he was catapulted to national fame and national attention and recognition. And David was a valiant and anointed warrior for God, and this brought great success to his life. But you all know how success is. It always has a two-edged sword because, you know, haters are going to hate. Remember how it was when you were uh, uh, on the same level of some of your boys you started enjoying promotion and they weren't your boys anymore. I remember I've had pastor friends that used to be my friends and now they're not my friends no more. And I was like, fine, I'll just give me new friends. But you know what? Success, it breeds success, but it also brings out the haters, right? Because here's what happens. When you kill a giant, you become one. You become one, right? And that puts a target on your back. And people want to hate you. And people uh, are jealous of your success. And they, they, it, it kind of uh, stirs up the ire and the indignation they have because, you know what, they, they're not enjoying that same success. And so it draws out that jealousy. And they'll stop. Some of the people, they'll just stop at nothing. And today, you, people get destroyed on social media. It's really something. But you know what? We see the same case with David with King Saul. Saul could not stand the recognition David was receiving, and he sought to destroy him. He sought to kill him, and Saul's pursuit of David became so intense that it was life-threatening, and one wrong step, and David was going to be killed and going to die. And at this point, David did not have much help. He was like a fugitive from justice, just running to stay alive. I want to encourage you right now, if you're not seeing the success you think you ought to see, just stay faithful to what God's called you to. Sometimes if you're just still standing, you're in a position to still win. Amen? 
And so he's running like a fugitive from justice just to stay alive. And we know that the pressure became so great that he went to the city of Gath to find refuge. Now, this is interesting because uh, life has prophetic, iron, ironic moments. There's moments of life where there's this prophetic irony that happens. And it's happened to all of us. David comes to fame because he killed the giant from Gath. And in the end, he's having to go to the giant's hometown to try to stay alive. Isn't that crazy? He kills Goliath from Gath, then he goes to Gath to try to find relief, but he's among the Philistines. And so, you know, sometimes a brother's got to do what a brother's got to do. So he acted insane. He mumbled and he dribbled, the, the Bible says he dribbled on his beard. And the reason he did that, because in those days, they thought insanity was contagious, right? I've certainly seen a dad pass it down to a son, but anyway, I'm sorry. I apologize for that. Right? They thought it was contagious. So it was a perfect thing because the king of Gath was spooked by it. He's like, hey, keep David away from me unless I too succumb to this insanity. So it was a great play, and uh, we see that he did it so well. He was like, I'd like to thank the academy. I mean, man, David was an actor, warrior, dancer, singer. I mean, he was all everything, right? He did it so well that it actually kept him alive for a season. And so after surviving that season with the Philistines, David took refuge in the fortress at the cave of Adullam. And we all know the story. When word spread about David's whereabouts, we see there were 400 guys that went to where David was. These were guys that Pat just mentioned. They, the Bible says they were in debt, they were in distress, and they were discontented. These men found themselves in circumstances that uh, were demeaning to them as men. It forced them into something less than they know what they were and what they could be. They were men in debt. They were men in lack. I want to tell you right now, if you're experiencing a season of lack, I want to encourage you that you still can do all things through Christ who strengthens you because David said in that verse, people always misquote Philippians 4.13, but what was he saying? He said, you know what? I have abounded and I have been impoverished. You know, it's kind of like what we would say in the South, I've been rich and I've been poor. Rich is better. You know, Poe is when you can't afford the O-R on the end of that. I've been rich enough. He said, I've abounded with blessings and I've been a base and I've lacked. He said, but in the end, whether I had it or didn't have it, it didn't stop me because I can do all things through Christ. Because when you're a warrior, you keep moving forward. Come on, somebody. You can do all things. These men were in debt. They were in lack. They were, in, they were also, the Bible says they were in distress because of the situations they were forced into, and that caused them to become more and more discontented with life. They knew they were more than what their circumstances said they were, and they knew they could achieve more than what they were experiencing in life. These were men who had a warrior on the inside of them. They just needed a leader to follow. Come on. They just needed a partner to stand with them. They just needed a fellow soldier with whom to link arms and fight. And they found that man in David in the cave of Abdullam. Come on, David was in a season of distress himself. He needed them just as bad as they needed him because those guys in the end, they pulled David out of a lot of situations. You know, John, you're from Australia. Here in the South, we, have, we, we, we all have accents, right? And how you say something, man, we, we've said this before. We, you, you all know this. If you, there's, a, there, there's a difference between a situation and a situation. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. These guys were in, they had a situation. You know what I'm saying? David was in a situation, but that's okay. No matter, your, no matter what circumstance you find yourself in, if there's a warrior on the inside of you and you can partner with another warrior, if one can put a thousand to flight, then two. Two can put 10,000. Amen? So they join forces. And what's interesting is that these 400 men who were discon, discontented uh, they, they're transformed in these mighty, they become known in history as David's mighty men. And at the end of David's life, they give a record, the Bible uh, provides a record of all the feats and the things that they did. It's quite amazing. You want to have your manhood challenge? Read some of the things like he killed a lion on a pit on a snowy day. What have you done lately? Uh, made it to work on time. I mean, come on. I mean, geez, is that all? <laughs> Many of them went on to kill more giants than David did. 
But in David, they saw a mighty warrior, and that released the warrior within them. You know, we're living in a time, as Pastor John was saying now, in our nation, we need some dudes to flat out just be some dudes. I end up getting a new car this year. I got rid of like an SUV soccer mom. It was a smaller SUV. It was a cool car, but I was like, I got a, I, I got a charger, I said, with a Hemi. Because it's like, you know what? I want to crank this thing up, and I want it to sound like a dude. <laughs> My mom says you're in a midlife crisis. I'm like, that's for me to know and for you to find out. But the fact is, you know, we just need some dudes to be dudes again. Our sons need to see men be men again, right? And more importantly, they need to see them being men of God, amen? Strong men of God, not wimpy men of God. These 400 men had been in debt, in distress, discontented, but now they're transformed into mighty men. And you know what? That transformation was not the result of some sweeping self-help change that they made to their life. It simply came as a result of releasing what was already on the inside of them. They were only discontented because, hey, they knew there's more in them than what was allowed to come out. They just needed to find the right partnership, and the warrior came out in all of them. And it wasn't just a handful of them that became mighty men. All 400 of them were transformed into mighty men. My goodness, that's so interesting to me that every one of them became a part of David's mighty men. And this underscores a truth, men, that still rings true today, and that's this. God has put a warrior on the inside of every man. I don't care who you are or where you are or what you're dealing with. There is a warrior on the inside of you. You're a stud. Come on, somebody. You gotta walk with that swag on you, right? Even if you, you're, you're having a bad day, it's a little bit of a limp. Just play it off. Right? Just play it off. Why? Because there's a, there's a warrior on the inside of you. We were made for battle because we were made in God's image. You ever see little boys want to wrestle? Why? It's because they have ADHD? No, it's because there's a warrior on the inside of them. And a hush comes over the crowd. Come on. God is a man of war. You're made in his image. You have his spirit on the inside of you. In the Old Testament alone, guys, there are 250 references to the Lord's title, Lord of Sabaoth. And what that is in Hebrew is simply translated in English, the Lord of hosts. In Hebrew, it's Sabaoth. It's the Lord of hosts. And you know what that literally translates into? The Lord of armies. We just serve the good shepherd. He he is. Thankfully, I I thank God he's a good shepherd. He's led me out of some situations. But when I needed him to fight, he became the Lord of Sabaoth, the Lord of armies. You know, when you tithe, uh, you know, I know we already had the offering, but just when you tithe, he says, I'm going to release the Lord of hosts, will rebuke the devourer for you. That means the Lord of armies shows up at your house and your bank account. 250 times it talks about the Lord of armies. It's a reference to the the fact that the Lord is the captain of the host of the armies of heaven. And that particular word, Sabaoth, speaks to the wrath and anger of God against his enemies. You know, have you ever seen a woman flip the script when somebody messes with her babies? You know, mess with a mama's boy. You know what I'm saying? Well, I mean, come on. How do you think God feels about you, you're his son, you're an heir and a joint heir with Jesus Christ, you're a king and a priest with him, come on, and when somebody messes with you, you're not, it's not just the good shepherd we're looking to, it's the Lord of hosts, the Lord of the armies of heaven, and his wrath will be stirred up against the enemies of his people, and right now we're facing in this nation around the world, the enemy lining up against the church to silence the church, to muzzle the church, to stop the church, but come on somebody, from the early days of the church to today the gates of hell will not prevail because he is the Lord of hosts. He is the Lord of armies and he fights against the enemies of his people. Somebody say amen. God's given us his warrior spirit. We see it throughout the Bible. These examples, Joshua and Caleb conquering the land of promise at 80 and 85 years old. Come on, that's amazing. Warriors, 
Gideon liberating the Israelites from the oppression of their enemies. Samson battling the Philistines. David fighting to extend the, the, the boundaries of Israel. And I love, I love this. The Apostle Paul, man, the dude fought city to city to preach the gospel. The beatings, the bruisings, the stonings. He got up and he kept preaching. You know, we find ourselves in a similar moment in history, guys, that demands warriors rise up. We're living in a day where good is being called evil. Evil's being called good. I came to tell it tonight. Come on. We know this, right? It's a time where free speech is under threat. Growing resistance against the church. We see that. The sexual confusion of a generation. And men are being relegated to weaker roles. Come on, I'm talking about you the man. All right? Well, then be the man. Come on, somebody. You know, we've been told that masculinity is toxic to the culture. But I want to tell you right, right now the real fact. You want the real truth? The real truth is the absence of strong, godly masculinity is what's toxic to the culture. They, we, the culture needs strong, godly. Not just some dude beating his chest, Right? I'm talking about strong, godly men who are faithful to the Lord, who are faithful to the house of God, faithful to the word of God. Amen? And come hell or high water. I feel like preaching old school. Come hell or high water. They're still faithful every day. Amen? Godly, strong men. The absence of that is what's toxic to our culture today. So if we don't rise up as warriors in this hour, who's, we're going to lose the next generation of young men. I want you to consider a couple of stats. 43% of boys are raised by single mothers. Right? Come on. Come on, guys. 78% of teachers are female. Close to 50% of boys have 100% feminine influence at home and 80% female influence at school. Where are the men? Where are the fathers? Everybody trying to be somebody, be a teacher and a preacher. But God, the scripture says, you, you got so many teachers, but I'm putting this in the southern version. You ain't got enough fathers. Quit trying to be somebody and be a dad. Come on. David's a great reminder of what it means to be a public success and yet still a domestic failure. Come on. Amen. Where are the men? Where are the fathers? Where are the warriors with the exorbitant percentage of Female influence on our sons, how do they learn to release the warrior and harness that warrior that God's placed on the inside of them? And what happens is we see many young men, they resort to violence. Why? Because the warrior is on the inside of them, but there's no godly male figure to help harness that. There's no David in their life to take the discontentment of life away and direct it so they can be warriors for God. Come on. But I think God is reversing that in the name of Jesus. Come on. Men are we're rising up to our responsibilities and our roles. Amen. Men of God. I just want to tell you right now that, that the Lord is, is, is calling men to stand up, speak up, and partner together like the 400 who partnered together with David. God is sending out a call to his warriors. Come on, men of God, the time of lack is over. The time of distress is over. The time of discontentment is over. Let's release the warrior. Let's release God's mighty men in the church and in the culture today. Amen. Like the wall behind me, this shield wall behind me, let's make sure that we stand together, that we hold the line, come on, for the kingdom of God, that we hold the line for the church, amen, but not just hold it from a defensive position, but run to the battle. Goli David ran to Goliath when everyone else was hiding. We're living in an age and an era today, you know, in 2020, we went through so many things like everyone did. Everyone. Everyone. But, you know, at church, it's like lockdown, bringing church back, uh, all the upheaval, all the tension. I lost my dad. You know, I'm like, what, el what else can happen? And the Lord's like, hold up. Two hurricanes came through our area. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> the Lord was like, there's more. And, you know, you're like, what else can happen in 2020? And so I just decided, you know what, forget it. We're going we're gonna to stand up. We're going to speak up. We're going to preach the word of God with boldness and power. Amen. And let the word of God do the work that it needs to be done. Amen. So if we're going to release the warrior men and we're going to be victorious in battle, 
I want to give you five things really quickly that are going to help us. Because we need training. We need direction. It's one thing to work up a, you know, you can get a football team worked up, but if you don't prepare that team for their opponent, all they were just going out there on emotion. They didn't have any game plan. Right? And so we got to have a game plan. We can't just come to a meeting like this and get stirred up like, yeah, and not know what to do when we go home. The first thing you got to do is that you got to use the sword. And I, I had a sword and forgot it in the back. But use the sword. That would have been a great tool for getting amens. I, <laughs> I could have, Brandon, I could have wheeled that sword right here. I said, say amen. <laughs> amen? <laughs> you got to use the sword. Ephesians 6, 17 says, and take up the helmet of salvation and what? The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Among the list, if you read Ephesians 6, I love it. He talks about put on the whole armor of God. But first of all, that's not where he started. A lot of times that's how we preach it. And put on the whole armor of God. But it says, first, be strong in the Lord. In the power of his might. And then put on the whole armor of God. It starts with the strength of God, right? And it's interesting when you look at the list of the armor that Paul references in Ephesians 6, there's only one offensive weapon. Everything is defensive. The shield of faith, helmet of salvation, it's all a defensive uh, uh, piece of armor. There's only one offensive piece, and that's the sword. Come on, because sometimes you have to have the defense to hold the line, but then you have to have the weapon you need to take ground. Come on, somebody. It's the sword of the Spirit. What is that? It's the Word of God. When we use the Word of God in the battles we face, we're wielding a powerful sword that cuts through the enemy's resistance in an era where everyone has an opinion. And in an era when everyone's a critic, guess what? Your opinion doesn't do anything, but when you use the Word of God, it does everything. The Bible tells us the Word of God is sharper than what? A two-edged sword. And it, and it pierces even down to between, the Bible says, uh, bone and marrow and muscle and to the intent goes right to the intents of a, uh, the intent of a man's heart. It's powerful. The word of God is more than just a source of hope and inspiration. It's a weapon that we're to wield in battle. The scripture tells us to resist the devil and he will flee from us, but how do we resist him? With the word. We've got to use the word of God. Remember when Satan was tempting Jesus in the wilderness? He said what? He said it is written. Jesus didn't say, thank you. I'm going to get those amens after all. I like this sword too because it's got the uh, Conan. I even got the muscles for that too, man. Come on. It's got the star of David over here on the, on the handle. But you know, it's the sword of the spirit. Come on. I just feel like a dude with this thing right here. All right? It's the sword of the spirit. But you know, it's more the B-I-B-L-E-S. That's, come on. That's the, that's the Sunday school version. But this is a man's version. It's a weapon. It is a weapon in your hand. Your opinion is not your weapon. Please hear me. Your opinion is not your weapon. Guess what? We all have opinions. We've told all of our team here at church, we're in the people business. We're not in the opinion business. All right? Why? Because your opinion doesn't carry any anointing on it. But the Word of God carries anointing on it. And it cuts. What did, what is, what did Jesus say? Well, if you ask me, Satan. He didn't say that. He said, it's written. And whenever you stick with what's written, whenever what he said is what you say, then you start wielding a sword. And that cuts through the enemy's schemes devices, strategies against you. You don't have to say amen, but it's still good, and I just like holding it for a second. But that's what the Word of God is. It's, it's the sword in your, in your hand. You know, a warrior must be trained with a sword. You know, when David went out to fight Goliath, it wasn't that we had this misconception that he was just this little kid and they threw a grown man's armor on him. That's just so, that's so incorrect. He was a young man. David was a stud himself. They didn't put the armor on him because he was... They, he was sizable to wear the armor. It's just that as a shepherd, he never had any training yet with a sword. What he had was a slingshot. That's what he was good with because now he later on became great with a sword. But David was the perfect person to fight Goliath because anyone's going to go hand-to-hand -hand combat. They're going to lose, but he was an assassin with that slingshot. Come on, right? And so my point in saying this is that the Bible says that the weapons of our warfare, they're not 
normal, natural, carnal, and they're not conventional. It doesn't matter. Quit allowing the norms of society to determine whether or not you get your sword out. Because that is the unconventional weapon that's going to defeat the enemy. Come on, amen? So a warrior must be trained with the sword in order to use it properly in battle. The same is true for the Christian soldier. He must know the word of God. You know, when Jesus returns to the earth in the second coming, that's different from the rapture. I don't have time to explain it. You can get the series. But I love end times, right? The rapture, the second coming, they're two different events. But when he comes back at the end in the second coming, he's going to come at the battle of Armageddon. And the, John describes it in the book of Revelation. And he says at that battle, the sword is going to come out of the mouth of God. That's like some epic Lord of the Rings stuff right there. A sword comes out of his mouth. What does that mean? It doesn't mean a physical sword is going to come out of his mouth. But the word of God that he speaks will destroy the armies of the Antichrist. And when you take what he said, and it becomes what you say, the sword comes out of your mouth to defeat the enemy. Amen? That's why it's so important for, for, for men to lead in your family of how to speak, what to say. Teach your sons. Teach your daughters. We're people of faith. We don't speak what we feel. We speak what the word of God says. Let the sword come out of your mouth. And if you will, it'll be better than a social media post. It'll be better than an opinion. Come on, fight the real fight. It'll drive out sickness and disease. It'll break the bondage of the enemy. Come on, Christian soldiers. We got to study to show ourselves approved, a workman and a warrior who needs not be ashamed to rightly divide the word of truth and use it. Come on. I, don't, I, I didn't come packing with a gun tonight, but baby, I'm still packing because I got the sword, the word of God. We've got to know what is written so that in the moment of crisis, what's written comes out of our mouth. Come on, guys. Not like I just feel like quit. Come on. Faith ain't a feeling. Faith's a fact. I just don't feel God right now. It's okay. God ain't, God's not always a feeling. But he's a fact when you don't feel it. And his word's a fact when you feel like you don't see it. You keep using that word. Number two, you got to fight the right fight. Come on. you got to fight the right fight. I mean, a, a true warrior isn't looking for a fight. He's just going to finish one when he needs to. Yo, Adrian. Come on, guys. You got to fight the right fight. Somebody say fight. The right fight. You know, don't, don't fight the wrong fights. We're living in a culture of fighting all the time. I mean, I'm sick of it. You're fighting all the time. I hadn't watched the news in so long, and I'm so at peace. It's amazing. Pe people are coming up to me at church. Hey, did you hear about this? Nope, don't tell me because I'm not watching. Right? The word of God is way more encouraging than the news. I mean, going up to the gas pumps, depressing it up. <laughs> Right? As I was stick with the word, right? And so you got to fight the right fight. David was successful in battle because he fought the right fight. He, he was fighting for the plan of God for Israel. As God's warriors, we got to engage in the fight for the kingdom of God and not pick unnecessary fights. Amen? That just makes you a bully. 1 Timothy 6.12, Paul said, fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of eternal life to which you were called you, when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. We must fight against anything that challenges God's word. we got to fight against the things that challenge our salvation. But we've also got to fight against the things that are in opposition to God's purpose and to God's plan. You know, as we said earlier, so many people are fighting. So many people are fighting on social media, hurling hatred and vitriol at each other. You know what we need to do, guys? We need the God never gave you the sword to turn the swords against each other. He gave you the sword to turn it against the enemy. Fight for each other, not fight against each other. Fight the right fight. Amen? Fight the right fight. We got to... Look, look, there's so much fighting over politics. We've got to be more wise and crafty than that. Right? Because there's certainly a deep political divide in our nation, but the issue isn't really what's happening in politics. It's the spiritual forces that are works behind the politics. Come on. That's the battlefront in which we must be engaged. So how do we know what to fight for? Number one, you've got to fight for the things that God's word fights for. If God fights for it, you fight for it. And number two, Fight with the prophecies that the God's Spirit has declared. 
Paul told Timothy, he said in 1 Timothy 1.18, Timothy, my son, hear my instructions for you. Based on the prophetic words spoken about you earlier, may they help you fight well in the Lord's battles. So when Satan tries to tell you you're not what God says you are, you remind him of that prophetic word that came to you. Come on and say, you know what? God's word says something different over me. I'm going to take that. That's a bullet in my chamber, and I'm going to take that and fight the devil. Come on, somebody. Amen? I'm always amazed at the story of Joseph. The Bible says when he was sold into slavery, he was a successful man. I'm like, how you figure? He said he was a successful man because God was with him. Why? He was armed with a dream. Come on, guys. He was armed with a dream. He was in Potiphar's house. He was in the pit. He was in prison. But you know what? He was a successful man. Why? Because God was with him. Where you are doesn't determine your success. It's who's with you in the middle of where you are that determines your success. Where you are is not your final address. You just keep battling and you keep warring and you're going to get there. Amen? Amen? Praise God. But you got to fight the right fight, not the unnecessary fights. Whatever God has decreed both in his word and prophetically, that is what you fight for. Number three, continue to advance. You got to move forward toward the end of Paul's life and ministry. He tells his spiritual son, Timothy, 2 Timothy 4, 7, he says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Paul was able to say this because he's always continued to advance the work of the ministry to which God had called him. He never stopped. Paul was driven. I mean, this guy, was, it was like, he was like a robot. I mean, he was anointed, appointed, and he was just driven for the rest of his life to do what God had called him to do, to take the gospel to the Gentile world. Come on, right now, God has opened up the windows of heaven over our church. <laughs> I, I hear, like Elijah, I hear the sound of abundance of rain, and I know you do too, so... I'm going to try to speak loud enough that you hear me well. But he, but he always continued to advance. You know, he was stoned. I mean, it's one thing. You had a bad week at work, but you weren't stoned. Now, I've been stoned on so I've been virtually stoned on social media, but that's, all right. that's not a physical stoning, right? You haven't been stoned. You haven't been beaten. You haven't been left for dead. One time he did die and God raised him back from the dead. You would think at that point he could cash in his stock and go retire. What did he do? He got up, he went to the next town, and he kept advancing. Come on. You know what a testimony it is to your family and to your sons and to your children to see their dad get up and be a warrior and keep advancing no matter what comes. Look at this, Acts 14, I'm about to close, 19 through 22. Then Jews from Antioch and Iconium came there, and having persuaded the multitudes, they stoned Paul, dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. However, when the disciples gathered around him, he rose up, went into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derbe. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith. What was he saying? He had just been beaten. He goes to the next three cities, and what is he telling them to do? Continue in the faith. Come on, men. What are we going to do? It doesn't matter what they're doing in society. It doesn't matter what their culture. It doesn't matter what they're trying to pass in Washington, D.C. What are we going to do? We're going to get up and continue to advance. Move forward. Move the church forward. That's what we're going to do, and that's what brings the ultimate change going to keep moving forward. Keep advancing no matter what. Number four, don't grow weary in the fight. Don't grow weary in the fight. We all know that we all know the scripture says, hey, if you don't grow weary in doing good, you're going to reap in due season. You know, sometimes we've heard preachers preach this like, you might be delayed, but you're not denied. But I'm here to tell you today, if you are following God's purpose for your life, you're not even delayed. You're just in the period between your last due season and your next due season. Come on, somebody. It's not like I've been, I, I've been delayed, but not. No, it's not that. It's that you had your last due season. You just stay faithful because guess what? My next due season's on its way. I'm going to continue to advance. I'm going to continue to move forward. So we all know life is a battle. And here's a news flash. You know what? People, you have an enemy, both in the natural and in the spiritual. You know, when, before I was the lead pastor, my, my dad was still the lead pastor at that time, you know, he and my mom and I would get the tax. You know, they would 
things would be said about us. But they always liked Mary, right? And Mary would always tease me, and she'd be like, I can't help it if people hate your family. I was like, girl, I would raise up on you right now, but she would say it in a joking way. But she was always shielded. And then, and then we, I become the lead pastor, and then a few months in, she came to my office one Sunday morning and goes, well, I was like, what happened? So-and-so told me what so-and-so was saying about me. And guys, I did it without even flinching. I was like, I can't help it if people hate you. <laughs> I was just waiting to pounce. I was, I was holding on to that one for a long time. But, but you got to be a real man. And you got to handle the sword. Come on, I, I, this sword's longer than the pulpit. I need a place to put it. Thank you, man. And so uh, here, here, here's the thing. You know, if we grow weary and we stop fighting, then you're going to start losing. Because whether or not you like it, you're in a war all the time. Even in seasons of peace, your enemy is plotting for the next season. Satan was overcome by Jesus in the wilderness for another opportune season. He never stopped harassing Jesus. You always have an enemy. When David finally became king, it was initially over the southern tribe of Judah and Benjamin. He only became king over the south, southern region. He did not become king over the ten northern tribes. He had not consolidated all those into one empire yet. So he spent seven years as the king of Judah at Hebron. And the Bible tells us in 2 Samuel 3.1, now there was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David, but David grew stronger and stronger, and the house of Saul grew weaker and weaker. Why? Because David would never stop fighting the fight. He had an enemy that was fighting him, and he never stopped fighting the fight. And I want to encourage you right now, guys, come on, keep fighting that good fight of faith. And as you do, you're going to grow stronger and stronger. You're going to take more territory. You're going to experience more blessings, more promotions. Come on, somebody. You're going to look back over your life and see how far God has brought you. We tell people all the time in our church, every, I mean, literally almost every Sunday, wake up, be faithful, go to bed, just do it over and over and over again. Keep advancing, and I'm telling you, you're going to grow stronger and stronger. Your victory's coming. Keep fighting, and you're going to discover strength in the battle. Remember the old song, Onward, Christian soldier. Amen? Are you a warrior? Have you been blessed tonight? I want to close with this last thought. Number five, don't stop fighting. You can't grow weary in the fight because if you grow weary, you're going to stop, but don't stop fighting. You know, this is an amazing record. David never lost a battle he fought in. This is amazing. I mean, what, what sports, what athlete could ever say that? I won every game I played in. David, guys, wrap your mind around this. He never lost a battle that he fought in. He only lost the battle he didn't fight in. Come on, somebody. David never lost a battle. When he went to battle, the dude won. It's when he didn't go to battle that he lost. You were made to be a warrior. There's a, there's a fighter on the inside of you. And when it's time to fight, you got to get up and fight. When it's time to go to war, you got to get up and go to war. And if you will, you have the Lord of Sabaoth in your corner. Come on, somebody. You got the Lord of armies fighting with you. How can you? It's when you don't, when, it's when warriors don't fight that they lose. Remember the story? It was in the spring and a time when kings go out to fight, but David. You know, if you read it in scripture, it said, and it happened. This is how it starts. And it happened. It's like, oh, buddy, did it happen? And it happened. It happened. What was it? Well, it, the it wasn't really the affair and all that. The it was you didn't go to fight when there's a fighter on the inside of you. Right? It's when a warrior doesn't go to war that everything else is out of place. So in a time when kings go out to fight, he, he, he had so much success he didn't go this time, and he stayed home, and that's when he met Bathsheba. That's when the affair happened. That's when she became pregnant. He plots and plans to have her husband murdered, and everything spirals out of control because the fighter didn't go fight. The warrior didn't go to war. That was the only battle he lost. It was the battle he didn't fight. And so, guys, you've come all this way. 
There's a warrior on this inside of you. Don't grow weary in fighting. Because guess what? If you read David's story, everything was a battle. Every level was a battle. And you all heard, you've all heard that preached before. It went every new level. There's a new devil, right? Why is that? Because it's true. It's true. Every step you go, there's the next devil. There's the next challenge. David challenged. He, he was challenged by his brothers. He was challenged by the lion, the bear, the giant. The Phil, I mean, at that time in his life, he was the enemy of the Philistines and Israel. He, he navigates that. He finally wins. He becomes the king of Judah. Then he's fighting the house of Saul for seven years. He finally wins that. Then he conquers, and he consolidates all of Israel. Then he conquers Jerusalem, and, which was Jebus at the time, makes it his capital city. It was a battle after battle after battle. He had success after success after success, except the time he didn't go to battle. So I want to encourage you. You know what? You were made for war. You were built for war. You were built for battle. Let's get up. Let's stand up. Let's be men of war. Come on, stand to your feet. Be men of war. Be men who run to the battle. Be men who teach their sons how to be bold. Come on, somebody. You want your, you know, here's the thing. We want to teach our sons to have that thing on them. Right? If you're going to play sports, you don't, you, you don't want a dude that's like, how are you doing? Uh-huh. Right. Great. Come on. He's gonna, that dude's going to get his eyes beat out. I tell Slade in baseball, my dude, man, you be nice and loving and a leader to everyone. But when you step on the other side of that chalk line, flip the switch. Right? Come on. Every day you leave the house, you got you to gotta put that warrior on. Amen? That doesn't mean you're going around looking for a fight, but they just know, come on, there's a bold man of God on the inside of you. Amen? You got that thing on you. In an era where men are being pressured to be something less, that's what creates a discontentment is when you compromise, become something less, and you know what's on the inside of you. Amen? Come on. I can see new victories coming to your life. Pastors, I see new victories coming to your ministries. Amen? New properties, new buildings, new territories, new expansions. Why? Because you're a warrior. That's why. You're a warrior. That's why. There was a time... When one of the fellow kings, he died, and his son took over. And David sent men to go, because that, the, the, the young man who took over his dad's throne, David had a good relationship with him. He had been not kind to David. So David sent men to this guy just to, uh, to comfort him and, and, and to give his condolences. And some of his guys said, you really think David, this great warrior, is sending guys over here just to pat you on the back and tell you it's going to be okay? He said, he's coming for other reasons. So this guy hires the Syrians. He gets his army together. You've all read the story. He gathers an army to fight against David. And, and uh, he insults some of David's men, cuts their beards off, right? And they come back to David's like, uh, excuse me, he, he, he did what? And let me just say, when David got finished with him, right? we're not walking around looking for the fight. But when the fight comes to us, come on, we're going to stand up. Speak up. Be bold. Amen. Put the devil in his place. <laughs> Amen. Come on. Amen. You like, you know, you, you know, I, you got to love this. Like, what'd you say? Say it again. Say it again, right? Come on, guys. There's a sword in your hand. There's a sword in your heart. There's a sword in your mouth. Open up your mouth right now and begin to give God praise. Come on. Worship the Lord of hosts. Worship the Lord of Sabaoth. Worship the Lord. He's the Lord of armies. Come on. Worship that mighty warrior that is your God, that is your king. He's the king of kings. He's the Lord.